Welcome back. Um, this is a really, for me, very exciting topic. What we're doing now is we're going to consider um, a second approach to thinking about diffusion. I've already indicated that I'm excited about this idea of the psychological inequivalence of different approaches to the same problem. And, you know, in certain sense, uh, diffusion by coin flips and diffusion by continuum theory couldn't be more different. The diffusion by coin flips is totally stochastic. You know, in other words, if you think back to the trajectories I showed you, you have a given realization, it's heads and tails, and the, the pos position of the random walker as a function of time is, uh, is, is stochastic. The diffusion by continuum theory is this really beautiful thing. And the reason I think it's so beautiful is that when you take many, many random walkers, each of which is doing nothing more than flipping coins, in the end, what that produces is an ever broadening and beautifully smooth Gaussian distribution where the, the variance is given by dt effectively, d being the diffusion coefficient. So, uh, so it's something that uh, was really beautifully described actually by Schrodinger in What is Life? And there what he says is he has this, this notion that you know every molecule is doing its own little independent thing and that yet together it gives rise to this emergent behavior, which we think of as the Gaussian if we're t looking at full space or the error function if we're looking at a half space and so on. So, um, so now we're gonna tackle this deterministic diffusion by a continuum theory approach. So that's, that's what we have in mind. So the, the way that I want this to unfold is by virtue of uh, a, a notion that I'm going to refer to as the continuum theory protocol and we're going to come back to it again and again through the rest of the term and the continuum theory protocol is five steps if you like you know it's a little bit contrived but not really you know it's it really is I think a very good way to organize your thinking when you confront a new problem and are likely to write down a continuum description whether it's for the motion of fluids or for the elastic deformation of a diving board or as is the case here for the the time evolution of a concentration field. So the protocol goes something as follows. We want to start out by identifying our field variables. And when I, when I say identify the field variables, what I mean by that is that at every point in space, we are going to identify a variable that is our metric or our measure of what's going on with the system. So for a mass transport problem, the field variable of interest is going to be the concentration field. and I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. The second part is really a matter of accounting. And when I say accounting, what I mean is that we're going to keep track of stuff. And whether the stuff we're keeping track of is mass or energy or momentum, what we're doing is we're, when I say we keep track of, I really mean that we're, we're doing like we would do in the old days with a checkbook. We're making sure that the accounts add up that all the money spent, all the money taken in, the difference between all of that is the, the amount that's sitting in your, in your checkbook. And so here we're going to impose the conservation of mass with the, the, the idea being that we're, gonna, we're going to discretize our system into a bunch of little material volume, element, volume elements. These are little cubes. And we're gonna ask during every time instance delta t, um, what's the change in the number of particles? That's what the equation that I have written underneath means. It means the change in the number of particles in our little box that's going to be equal to the number of particles that flow in minus the number that flow out. It's kind of very evident. The third step in the protocol is to write down what I'm going to refer to as a constitutive law. And where that comes from is hunches, experiments, inferring, guessing. You know, it's, it's actually how we do science. You know, we're, we're no better off than anyone else out in the world in the sense that, you know, we have our pathetic thinking, we have our limited imagination, and we make guesses, the difference, you know, in what we're trying to do here and maybe what goes on in Washington, D.C., is that rather than, you know, at least our best selves, rather than having an agenda, what we want to do is we want to posit things, we want to make guesses, but then we want to go out in the world and we want to find ways to kill those hypotheses, to show that they're wrong. And if we keep on doing that and we keep on finding they're not wrong, finally, we might be, uh, have an increased confidence in the correctness of those hypotheses. So here, in the context of diffusion, the constitutive model is going to be Fick's law, which we've already talked about, which relates flux on the one hand and concentration gradient on the other. The fourth step is to derive the governing field equation. And there, what we're going to do is unite 
the balance loss, step two, which leads to the thing you see up in the top left of number four, which is the rate of change of concentration is equal to the divergence of the flux. And on the right, we have fixed law. We put those two things together, and what pops out is this governing partial differential equation. And I, this is my first opportunity to say it, which is that although in biology we're very dedicated to molecular interpretations of things, I think we should be equally dedicated to higher level emergent descriptions, often which will be couched in the language of partial differential equations. So this is our first example, the, the partial differential equation for diffusion. And the reason it's a partial differential equation is the concentration depends on both position and time. That means a differential equation is a differential equation for a function that depends on more than one variable. So, but later, we'll be interested in the flow of uh, fluid within the giant algae uh, cara. And when we think about that problem, we're going to use a different partial differential equation. And la uh, later than that, or earlier than that, I'm not sure yet which, we'll follow Mahadevan and Cliff Tabin and Amy Shire and others in their work on gut folding. And there we'll use the theory of elasticity. And that will be described by yet another partial differential equation. And then later on, we'll talk about viscoelasticity in the context of junctions between cells, and we'll use a different continuum description. So the, the idea is that this notion of writing down partial differential equations is ubiquitous and powerful and is a concrete realization of the buzzword of emergence that we hear all the time. So this is a higher level description. The final point in the protocol is to use the boundary and initial conditions to solve some problem of interest. So with that as our background, let's actually now talk about the protocol. So I already said that the first step in the protocol was to discretize our system into a bunch of material volume, volume elements. And, um, and in each of those volume elements, we define our field variable, which in this case, my field variable is going to be C of R and T. And that's going to be defined as the number of particles in the box at position R divided by volume of that little box. So this is number of particles and volume element at position R, and this is the size of the volume element. And you know, you might be saying to yourself, well, how big is the volume element? And I don't really want to answer that question exactly, but you know, the, the way I would put it is big on the scale of molecules and s small on the scale of the variation in the system. And you can see that reflected in this diagram where, you know, going from bottom to top, at the bottom we have a high concentration down here. At the top we have a small concentration and there's a gradient in this, in this direction, a decreasing concentration profile. And you can see that one of these boxes is small in comparison with the rate at which the concentration field is varying. So at any rate, the first step in the protocol, we've already worked it out, is for the problem here that we're thinking about, which is mass transport, the, the concentration field is our field variable of interest. So we've obeyed the first of the items here, which is identify the field variables. So we've done that. That's the first thing. So now what we need to do is we need to impose the conservation laws. So the conservation law that we're going to have in mind here is the conservation of mass. And let me comment on that a little bit, and then I'll, I'll just show you the, the relevant e equations. So, um, so the, the diagram here is intended to show you that I'm going to focus my energy on thinking about the time evolution of the concentration in this particular box. This is the box centered at position x. So this is the x-axis running along in this direction. And my box of interest is the one centered at, at position x. And when I write down the conservation, I do it as follows. I say, as you know, we're going to do this over and over again, I say the number of particles in the box at x now at time t plus delta t is the number of particles that were in the box before at time t delta t seconds ago. And then I add to that all the particles that came in to my box from the left, which is these guys. And I subtract all the particles that went out on the right, which is these guys, and give them by this. Just as a little bit of a reminder, uh, I think I, I already wrote this down, so I've, I've already pre-written down some of the key things I want to say. So flux 
is defined as number of molecules, in this case, per area, per time. So what I do is I take this area that I'm showing you here, and I figure out in a time delta t how many molecules came across that area. And that area, by the way, is delta y delta z. So that's the reason that delta y delta z appears here because that's the area of this square through which the particles are flowing. So, um, so you know, the, this, this particular uh, example, the mathematics invites us to try to simplify things. And I, I'm going to repeatedly make reference to uh, the David, the statue David in, in Florence, and how when you walk into the, the gallery where you find that amazing statue, uh, on the way in, there's the um, there's a previous gallery I think called the Gallery of Prisoners, and it shows um, it shows these unfinished statues of Michelangelo, where the, the figure is trying to burst out of the uh, the unfinished figure is trying to burst out of the rock, and and in a way, when I see an equation like this, it's it's actually trying to burst out of this and become a differential equation, and that's what I'm going to try and demonstrate to you. So by taking this equation up here and taking the n of x and t and putting it on the other side by subtracting n of t x and t from both sides and then dividing by delta t, I get this equation. And note that I've rewritten the right-hand side by putting this minus sign, I've changed the order of these two terms. The reason for that is that I'm anticipating, I see that this thing wants to be a derivative of j. So that's what I've anticipated. The left-hand side, I see, it dn di is dn by dt, which is the same as dc, where c is the concentration by dt, times the volume. And so what we get out of this is this very, very cool result, which is the local form of conservation of mass. It tells me the rate of change in the concentration is given by minus the divergence of the flux. So those two things are related to each other, and this is, this is our balance law. So this is step two in the protocol. We've actually achieved step two. Impose the conservation law, and in our case, imposing the conservation law amounted to dc of x and t by dt is equal to minus dj of x and t by dx. So that's what our conservation of mass looks like. And it, the reason I call it local is that I'm sitting in a room right now and I could say that the total number of molecules is fixed in the room, but that doesn't, that's a global version of conservation, but that doesn't mean that I can't take a molecule right here and remove it right here and have it appear all the way across the room. That, would be, that satisfies the global, the global mass conservation, but this indeed does not sought, satisfy the local conservation shown here. This is saying I have a little tiny box, and all the action has to be local. I'm not allowed to take and add and subtract um, particles at distant points. So that's what I mean by the local version. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do the, the next step in the protocol, because we already have fixed law. Okay, Fixed law is the third step, which is the constitutive law. And this just tells me that the steeper the concentration gradient, the larger the flux, the steeper the change, you know, this is one version, this is another. This guy right here is going to have, a, so I'm plotting C versus X. This guy is going to have a much larger flux because there's more particles to the right that can jump by coin flipping. Okay. So now the, the final step is I'm going to plug the constitutive model into the law of mass conservation. So this is the fourth step in the continuum theory protocol. That is what I do here. So I have minus dj by dx. That's the same as minus d by dx of j. And when I do that, as long as d is a constant, what I find is, is the diffusion coefficient times d squared c by dx squared. Okay, so this is really the big result. This is our first partial differential equation that we think is going to describe biological systems, and it's the so-called diffusion equation. Okay, just in passing, I see that I already put this figure in, so just as a reminder about fixed law, 
um, you know, here I'm showing you two different concentration profiles, C1 of X and C2 of X. And what I was asking you to accept is your intuition that in this case, there'll be more particles flowing to the left than in this. And the way I would think about that from the standpoint of coin flips is that if every one of these particles that I show you here flips a coin, and if it gets ahead, it, it goes right, and if it gets a tails, it goes left, then half the particles here are gonna go that way and half are gonna go this way and ditto for this other side. So the larger the concentration gradient, the larger the net flux because n over two is a larger number for more particles on the right. Okay, so, um, so with all this, what we've done is what we've achieved is we've written down a partial differential equation and here I'm giving you a first indication of what a solution looks like okay so i told you the next thing we, we will want to do is when we have our partial differential equation describing some system of interest whether it's the flow and uh, the large algal cell cara or the gut buckling that i already mentioned or whether it's diffusion um, the upshot is that um, the upshot is that we we can work out solutions to these problems and so in this case um, what I'm showing you is the solution of the diffusion equation for one-dimensional free space. What do I mean by one-dimensional free space? That sounds like a mouthful and sounds kind of obscure. But what I mean by that is that I start out at t equals zero. At t equals zero, I start out with a spike of concentration, which I'm showing you here in green. So at the initial instant, I pipe that in some molecules, and they're all at the origin. And now I start my stopwatch. And what will happen over time is that this will broaden. It will broaden in the way that's shown here. So initially it will broaden to this. A little while later it will broaden to this. A little while later it will broaden to that. And what I'm telling you, this is not, this is not wishful thinking. I'm telling you, if you actually solve the equation, which you will do in the homework, then what you will find is that the solution is a Gaussian. And notice, interestingly, that the width of the Gaussian is 4 dt. The reason that that's interesting is because I've already mentioned this idea that you know, we, we've already invoked quite a few times um, that the mean square displacement goes with linearly in time or alternatively that the root mean square goes like the square root of time. So that's, that's what I mean by a solution uh, in that case. And let me give you a second example, which is a solution for a half space. So one of my collaborators has been interested in chemokine gradients and whether or not um, mammalian cells migrate towards higher, higher, grade, higher concentrations. And so we worked out the solution for this half space. And what do I mean by that? So you see here at t equals zero that all the chemokines are uniformly distributed to the left, and then we remove this partition, and then we watch the time evolution afterwards. And so this is the initial condition. And what you see over time is that this thing is broadening out and flattening out. And in the long time limit, notice the concentration is at a half and uniform. So that's the solution for a half space. And in this case, the solution is of the form C of X and T is basically equal to, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be in a little imprecise about this, but it's an error function. So, um, so you'll have to look that up or maybe we'll actually do this in a, in a homework problem. But the, the key point is that um, that's what a solution looks like in this case. Another example that we're going to be very interested in is uh, what's called photo fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. So here, as you can see, um, we have a cell, we have some, some GFP tagged protein, which is in the endoplasmic reticulum. And then we turn a vice into a virtue. And what do I mean by that is, you know, photo bleaching is annoying. And yet people like Watt Webb were very clever and they, they figured out a way to see a silver lining in that cloud by using it to examine the dynamics of molecules. So you, you photo bleach this square region that you see here, and then watch the evolution over time of the fluorescence. So you know, here, and then here, and then here, 
fluorescence is recovering. So you will have a chance to do a one-dimensional version of fluorescence recovery after photobleaching, where you'll consider a bacterial cell, and then you'll photobleach it, and then by solving the diffusion equation and also using the master equation, we'll be able to work out the recovery. So here's the initial condition, and then this is a time a little bit later, and then this is a time a little bit later, and this is a time a little bit later than that. And so th this basically, once again, we appeal to the diffusion equation. It gives us a way to think about these problems. So my summary of what we've just done is we've introduced for the first time in the course the continuum theory protocol. We used it in order to derive a differential equation, a partial differential equation for the space-time evolution of molecules that are undergoing diffusive dynamics. And we can use that diffusion equation in all sorts of different contexts, some of which we will. So I already told you about, uh, about this one, which is the infinite space solution, which is Gaussian. I talked to you about this one, which is the half space. We can clearly do problems having to do with spheres, you know, which you see here. So we can work out the time evolution of photo bleaching in a circle or in a sphere. We can look at concentration gradients having to do with uh, positional information in embryos, and we'll be able to think about problems like chemotaxis. So all of these are solutions to the same governing equation, which I think is really cool because, you know, one of the things that tells you you have a principle, a principle, is that it has broad reach, that it, it doesn't apply just to the one specific instance that might have motivated you in the first place. But by the time you've worked it out, you actually see, oh, I can use this in all sorts of different contexts. And I'm trying to say that the diffusion equation is such a, uh, a model. So thanks for, uh, thanks for listening.